So thank you all for coming. Um, I'm Maria Sciano. I have been here, well, in a few days it'll be one year, which I can't believe. <laughs> thank you. A little bit about me. Uh, I started my career with undergrad, graduate school. Um, I worked at NYU for 13 years. I moved to New Jersey and I was commuting and that was too much for me. So I worked at, I left NYU, I worked at Raritan Valley for about a year and a half and then I came here. So I've been doing disability services, I would say about eight years. So um, this presentation really is not me lecturing to you. It's uh, a foundation for you to understand what we go through and for you to understand the students a little bit more. Uh, I think an interactive presentation is better than me reading 20 slides. So please at any point if you have any questions stop me and I will answer them. So we start with this. Think of your students and their different learning styles. If you have a monkey, you have an elephant, and you have a fish, and you give them a task. Which of these animals can climb the tree? So Einstein actually said everyone is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing it's stupid. And this was a quote that I did not know. It was actually a student sitting in my office, um, high-functioning Asperger's on the autism spectrum who was not tearful, but very frustrated in that he was taking English 1, and he was debating with me why a rose represented love. And I'm saying to him, well, you have to think about it. We don't, yes, it's a flower, but it can mean many different things. And he couldn't wrap his head around it. He's like, I'm failing the class because my professor wants me to write a poem about a rose. And to me, the rose is a flower. So this was a challenge for him. Um, and I think this puts kind of everything in perspective in a lot of ways, because we realize that every student is different. You're going to see a lot of students. Of course, you've been teaching for a while. And the truth of the matter is, is when you get an accommodation letter, you have no idea what that student is presenting with. So we gave a sample of the accommodation letter, and you've seen them all. Um, nowhere on that letter does it say why. You have no idea what the diagnosis is, what the history is, what the background is of a student. You don't know where they come from. All you have is a letter, talks a little bit about the law, a little bit about what an accommodation is, their name, and the list of the accommodations they receive. So I'm sure uh, there's a lot of assumptions that are made. And, and this is stuff that I see all the time. So keep in mind a lot of different categories. At CCM, we on an average have anywhere from 800 to 1,000 students registered with my office every given semester. Uh, this semester for finals alone, we administered over 350 exams. So we are quite busy. And they come to us for many different reasons. So physical, medical, psychological, sensory, learning, ADD, ADHD, autism spectrum, and other. And then you have students that have all of the above or a combination of. Um, it, it's quite common to have one or more disabilities. The truth of the matter is, is that most of us believe, especially in a community college setting, that the students only have learning disabilities. It's not the highest population anymore, actually. Uh, you're seeing, especially in the four-year schools, psychological mental health diagnosis is on the rise. So more students are registering because of high levels of anxiety, depression, um, the thought of leaving home, financially insecure. So the psych diagnosis is growing. Um, so that, with that, it's going to come a bunch of different types of accommodations. So as far as documentation is concerned, 
Dr. Zaza can tell you that students try to walk into our office and say, I need extra time, no matter what the situation is. We cannot just grant them extra time. Please keep this in mind. I have to, my office has to follow very specific guidelines. Um, I am a little strict when it comes to documentation. My feeling is whether it's a community college or a four-year college, it should always be seamless. It should be when you transfer from one college to another, your documentation shouldn't be outdated. Technically, New Jersey doesn't have certain standards. Coming from New York, New York, you had to report to the state, you had to go by a disability category. Every, if you got audited, the documentation had to be in a certain order, in a chart. Here, we don't have those regulations, but that's still something that I follow. Uh, as students are transitioning out of high school, uh, we try to push back on the high schools that students should really be evaluated before they leave school so that we're getting relevant information. So most students, if they have ADD or an, a learning disability, they're being tested as an adult, which for us is very important. So very, very strict guidelines as far as documentation is concerned. We do this so that we are compliant with the ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, students are now going, it's a new process that I put in place, students are going through an intake process individually. We don't exclude parents because most students have had their parents alongside of them their whole lives. Uh, so now is to me not the time to take it away. My discussion, if it's either myself or Jean Rafino that's meeting with students, it's everything is directed at the student. It's not directed at the parent. They're signing agreements now, especially in regards to testing. Um, as far as their accommodations and what they're approved for, they're signing off on that. Um, also, if they receive permission to audio record, then they sign an agreement for that as well. And we'll talk more about that later. But I want you to know that this isn't something that they send us the documentation and ooh, they all of a sudden have these lists of accommodations. There's actually a process. The law has changed in the past few years. We now, based off a lot of lawsuits, we now have to take into consideration history. So if a student can prove history of a disability, we have to take that into consideration. So if they were diagnosed with something when they were two and they have always received services since then, we have to take that into consideration. Keep in mind, K through 12 and higher education, very different. So a lot of students talk about IEP, 504. We don't necessarily call that on this level. We call it an accommodation plan. So when a student says to you, oh, you're not using my IEP, or I'm going to bring you in my IEP, send them to us. <clears throat> so examples of accommodations, which I'm sure you've seen. The extended time is a big one for most students. Um, yes, it's true, most students don't always use the extended time, right? We're not stapling them to the desk and saying you have to stay the full time of the test. Um, so it, to me, it's more of a safety net. They know it's there, it lessens the anxiety, hopefully they slow down, hopefully they review. When we meet and we talk about it, those are the things that I mention. Um, we even go through the placement exam now, step by step, math, computer literacy, English, so they know what they're walking into, which I think, again, all about education. If we tell them up front, maybe they'll know a little bit more as they move along. Computer for exams and notes. I think this will eventually no longer be an accommodation as we move to every classroom with computers. Um, but for some students, as far as processing is concerned, computer, a computer has changed their lives, right? It's a known fact that for some students, 
typing is a lot easier than them handwriting. It helps with the process. If you're dysgraphic and you have issues with writing, the computer can help you be organized and put your thoughts together. It's not going to give you the thoughts, but it's going to help at least a little bit to put it all together. A basic function, function calculator, for those of you that teach math, we're never allowed to approve a higher functioning calculator. But this guarantees a student, even for placement, a basic fun four function calculator. Um, alternate format to print, which is a big one. Students with visual issues, students with reading issues, reading fluency issues, um, they ask for books on tape, which we still do, or now electronic format, because most laptops will read information to you out loud. It's gotten a lot better. MacBooks are great for it. Uh, permission to tape record, we'll talk more about that. Use of assistive technology, huge, 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 huge now. Whether you for reading, whether for writing, um, we offer quite a number of services in our office. The same thing with computer for reading assistance. Uh, a computer reading to you doesn't provide an advantage for a student that has a reading disability. It's literally reading the information out loud. There is no explanation. It's not changing the words. It's not defining the words. It is just verbally speaking the words. That is it. Uh, and reduce distraction testing setting. So a lot of professors will offer students extended time in the classroom, which I'm all for. But a lot of students will say, I don't want that. And that's the nature sometimes of their disability. They feel confined. They feel, oh my god, I'm going to rush through this because I'm watching everybody else leave the room and I'm going to be the last one sitting in the room taking the test. That's why I believe our office offers a unique opportunity, which keep in mind not every college has a great disability testing center. So students have the ability to take exams with us. So. This is where I want you to tell me what you think the disability is when it comes to which accommodations they have received. So extended time, double time, no Scantron, use of assistive technology, use of a computer, use of a reader or a scribe. Visually impaired, correct, right? So. Again, something that exists on this campus. We have quite a few students that, a lot of dogs, seeing eye dogs walking around, uh, a lot of canes. We have students with different visual needs. Uh, pet peeve of mine, I know a lot of you use the Scantron, but there really is no Scantron is there for a reason. I, I, we, I used to do a summer with the Commission for the Blind. We had all these students come from the Commission these students were blind, and the professor was insisting, I don't understand why they can't fill the Scantron out. We, we can certainly fill it out, right? But then it's like taking information that another a student is, and it's putting it on us, right? It's not that we're trying to be difficult. It's that they can't see the bubbles. They, they can't, for a student with severe ADD, those bubbles are so completely frustrating. So that's like a little thing of mine. Um, it's, again, not something that we give out lightly. If they can do it, they can do it. But if it is there, think of the reasoning behind it. So here's another one. Time and a half, reduced distraction, permission to take breaks, preferential seating. So this is one that you know, may not exist here because we don't have large lecture halls, right? But if students want to sit up front, Students want to sit by the door, right? So they may ask a professor, you know, most professors don't assign seats, maybe in a lab setting. So, but they may want to choose their seat based on their disability. Any, any clues, any ideas? Anxiety. Anxiety, ADHD, right? Anxiety, huge one. You see students, PTSD, Right? Loud noises, certain things that are really going to freak them out in the classroom. Uh, they want to sit by the door. They're, they may have a panic attack in the middle of your class, and they want you to know 
that they have the permission to walk out of here. Not that they're being rude, right? Um, had, a, had a professor that said to me, I never allow breaks during exams. I said, think about a student that has Crohn's disease. If they have to get up and go to the bathroom, I don't, I don't care who anybody is. That, I mean, that's the, they have to get up and go to the bathroom. They will tell you, crying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I have to go. It's the nature of what it is. It's, it's, they, it's fight or flight kind of mentality. Again, it's not about being rude, but huge stomach issues. I have to go to the bathroom. And that's what you have to think. You have, yeah, yeah. Um, is that something that student services is going to notify us of, or is that okay that the student just tells you? And how do you know if they're just using that as an excuse to leave the room to cheat? Right, which is another big thing. You don't know, right? Here is the letter. The letter is not going to say, I have Crohn's, I have this, I have that. That's something that they would be able to go to you if they had this digestive issue that's part of the accommodation. Correct. Package. Okay. Yes. And so, we always tell students, right? That's how we have them sign a bunch of agreements. If you're gonna use it to cheat, then you're taking advantage of it, right? The reality is most students and most students that I've seen, they're not looking to push, especially with a diagnosis like that. I mean, I've seen students stage four cancer. They're on chemo. They, I mean, it's, it's reality. They're not gonna push the limits. Is every student gonna be perfect? No. I, I mean, I'm a realist, so uh, it's it's hard to say. It's hard to say if they leave your room if they are going to go and cheat. But, but if a student says that to me, but they haven't gone to you yet, it's appropriate for me to refer them to your office before a hundred a hundred percent. That's it. That's number one, right? If a student gives you any kind of information and you've never received a letter from us, you should encourage them to meet with us. I mean, every professor is going to have policies, right? You can't be abstinent. You can't be late. Students with, that are narcoleptic, that are taking 8 o'clock in the morning classes, I'm like, what were you thinking? You, you know, I mean, really. So yes. <laughs> or severe ADD. They're on a lot of medication. They have psych issues. So I mean, don't take the 8 o'clock in the morning. But if they're giving you these, if they're telling you, I have x, y, and z, if they're handing you documentation, do not take it. Do not take it. Certain professors ask for doctor's notes when students are chronically out. I get it. But if they're telling you, I've been, in the, I've been admitted to a psych ward, which I'm sure maybe some of you have heard, send them to us. You don't want to go there. Legally, you don't want to go there. You don't want to be responsible for this type of information. Well, I told this professor, how come they're not giving me what I want? It's not your right to do it. It's our job to do it. So feel free. If you're unsure about something, that's exactly it. They're going to give you, yeah, they give you stories, right? I mean, that's, that's when you say you should go and really get it certified. Come back with an accommodation letter. What happens if a student never has gone to you, yep. never has now fails the course, and all of a sudden we have all these issues. Accommodation, yep. <laughs> mm -hmm. Accommodations are never retroactive. A student can never go backwards. So when they sign these forms, you could read it. It's now on my intake form. It says accommodations are not retroactive. So we talk about the letters, right? If you decide to not hand in the letter, and you take your midterm without your extended time, and you fail, you cannot come back and say, oh, wait a second, I want to take the test over with my accommodations. It's not going to happen. I, I am I'm very strict on this. It is a student's responsibility. They're in college. They have to make a plan. They have to have a discussion with their professor. I said, I'll advocate for you. If there's an issue, I'll talk to any professor on your behalf. But you have to come and let me know. But there is no going backwards. Okay, so nope. if, a student, if a student 
We only get the accommodations letter after they have met with you or your colleagues. Correct, yes. So we never get a letter, and all of a sudden, they fail. We are not bound to do anything. Okay. That's exactly Legal. it. Legally, we do not have to do anything. Even if they come up with all these yep. accommodations. We had a student, Dr. Azaza had a student this semester, failing, failing, failing. Student says, I sent in my, all my information. One, we never received it. Two, it doesn't matter if they've sent it in. If we haven't met with them, if they haven't handed that letter in, null and void. They don't receive anything, and they can't, they can't go backwards. They can't say, oh, well, I used to get this in high school, and so I thought that all my professors are going to know now. No. Okay. No. And whether it's a traditional student or a non-traditional student, right? Doesn't all the rules are the same. So whether you're 100 or you're 17, same rules. Yeah? Oh, <laughs> Get to it, but Good, beautiful question. A lot of assumptions, right? What I see all the time, especially speaking to faculty in, on a community college level, the idea is that the student isn't capable, right? That the student has a learning disability and that they shouldn't necessarily be in college. There are those few, don't get me wrong, right? But for the large part, you have a lot of capable students with issues. So they feel discouraged, one, because they don't want to be judged. Two, which is more of my belief, I think the K through 12 system does a lot to limit a student. This is the first time maybe that they're in a regular class, right? This is the first time that they're in a classroom that doesn't have an aid. Right? What was the level of expectation for them in high school? I mean, think about it. My kids go to Roxbury. There's three different levels, four different levels of math, four different levels of English. Think about it in that way. So now you're getting a student that's walking into college that is, has been left behind in some ways by the system. So they, they I can't, I want to do it on my own. I want to do it without my accommodations. I didn't see that it really helped me. Half of them don't know about the technology that's available for them. So I would say those are the overwhelming. How many students we see, they come in, summer, they register, they never come back. They do poor for full semester. Spring, they're in our office. Hmm, maybe I should really use that. So now, this whole, forget it, I've been packed this past few weeks. We closed down for intakes during finals. But I say to them, if you don't remember anything that I've said, come back in the fall to get your letters. We'll walk you through it. That's all we can do. On this level, we can't force them to do anything, right? We can't notify you. We can't say, here it is. For certain disabilities we do, if we have a deaf and hard of hearing student, if we have a blind student, usually those students want us to reach out to you and say, how do you teach? How do you do this? We're going to have a note taker in the classroom, things like that. You're welcome. Yeah? I just want to add to, to what you said. I mean, I see that so much in, in our office. Students, if they don't tell us, we don't know. And then when they don't do well, you know, um, so, you know, it might come out. I mean, I'm not legally, I can't ask them legally. I no. understand that. Right. But it's really difficult, too, for me to help them if they don't tell me. So, you know, I try and talk about different things to see if it'll come out, and, and it will. And then ultimately, you know, especially with the male students, you know, they're so proud. They're like, I really don't want to do that anymore. Yep. And so I think that's a really an emotional thing. Yes. You know, that they really want to do it on their own, and I try and explain to them, we want to have you level the playing field with all the other college students, you know, you're in a different environment, and, and try to explain to them that, you know, why do this to your adult record, you know? And so, it takes, sometimes it takes them a year before I get them to <laughs> see you. Yep. But um, what I was wondering was, 
this information <clears throat> for students, is this embedded in admissions and in the presentations that we do for new students coming in? Because I think that if you could catch them as they're coming in and present the differences from K to 12 and, and tell them how it works here, you know, and, and maybe to the general population coming in, I know you have certain orientations for disability students coming in, but for the general population, if you, you know, catch them, is there anything embedded? It's a, it's a conversation with Dr. Simmons um, for me to do at least a five minute blurb at general or, uh, orientation. Mm -hmm. So I hope to do that. Mm -hmm. um, what I try to encourage students and what I tell them is this exists at, at every college across the United States, which a lot of them don't believe. They think it's something that's unique to what, you know, CCM or a community college. They don't think, I'm like, I have friends that work at Harvard that do the same thing that I do. And then they kind of look at you. So I try to normalize that as much as possible. Um, I want to start with the general message for them to understand that it is different. It's not limiting. Um, we're not modifying. We're not changing. Mm -hmm. I can understand the anxiety. You know, if they redid our office and they, it's a big sign that says disability, right? And a lot of people are like, why do you have to do that? Because of the law. It's got to be searchable. It's got to be findable. We have to have a voice and a some kind of something on campus that students can find. And it becomes very particular now. I mean, if your policies and procedures are not up on your websites, you can be sued. So there's a lot of legal ramifications for us to change things. So please know that Case Horizons no longer exists. Um, that was a grant-funded program. They primarily only worked with students with learning disabilities. We, and I know that it was over on Dean Caffey's side for a while, so that is all we're doing everything now. Yep. If you get the letter, the acknowledgement from the student, you sign off on it, and then it's their turn to bring you the paperwork with the testing. Yep. So that you can attach the test and bring it over there. Yep. Unfortunately, something happened when I asked the student. I didn't say, "Do you have your your paper from your testing paper from disability so that I can put the test with it because I want to walk it over today?" I didn't say that. I just said, "Do you have any paperwork for me?" That's all I said. The girl was very nice. She waited till after class. She came up to me and said, "First of all, you just told my entire class that I'm disabled." I'm like, "I did. How so?" So she explained by pointing it out. I said. I asked anybody for homework too. I just turned around to you and said, you have any paperwork for me? I didn't say for what, for why, for any, it could have been for any reason. I think some students get really touchy about certain things. You know, we try to tell them, professors are human, right? So you're not the first student that they've ever had. It, it's gonna happen. I say try to do things like that alone after class, you know. Is it, are you going to be able to please every student? No. Were you legally saying, here's a kid with disabilities? No. I mean, it's, I would have said to the student, what, what, was, what do you believe the intent was? She was trying to help you get the test. It, you know, I mean, they have to realize that it has to be open communication in some ways. I don't think that that necessarily would have gotten in trouble. Now, I have had professors that blatantly have said, you know, the disability students, can you make sure that you see me <laughs> after class so that, yes. So it's all about how you approach it. Uh, I mean, I, those are the things. Like if you say, you with a disability, can you, right? <laughs> no. So afterwards. Sometimes the students also, they give this something to send you like, in front of other students. Yes, also. that's exactly right. So they, they don't even like approach you personally. Yes. And then of course, you know, sometimes you can kind of like, I mean. Some of them are going to care, and yeah. some of them are not going to care. That's exactly. Yeah. And I try to explain when you're giving the accommodation letter, you should do it on your own time. You give, I mean, those meetings last an hour, right? Because I try to walk them through every kind of scenario. So. Give the letter before class. Give it after class. Go to office hours. I said, 
I haven't heard yet of a student in the middle of a class handing up their accommodation letter and saying, here's my accommodation. You have had one? Oh, yeah. oh <laughs> changing my story then. <laughs> yes. Oh, by the way, we're recording. Yes. <laughs> So that's exactly it. They disclose more than we do. So don't worry about it. That's it. And if there is anything like that, I mean, always. A student doesn't have to come. That's another thing. They don't have to come to your office and explain their disability to you, right? That's key. OK. I mean, that, that just because they hand you a letter, they don't have to give you an explanation. Some of them are very uncomfortable with that. Others, uh, you know, I have this, I have that, da, 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 I don't know. But some of them are very, I don't want you to know what's different about me. Yeah? I just, I had a person, a student this semester, English as a second language, that could almost benefit from a lot of what you offer. Not a disability. <laughs> yep. Not a disability. No. And we get that all the time. That's an advantage. That's something, if a professor feels that they benefit from extra time, that's up to a professor. But it's not legally the same thing. And, you know, it's just funny that you know, they could really, some of this, when they need that extra time to read and things like that, and that's one of the reasons they're not successful. Yes. I'm going to jump on I do ESL and CSS. Yeah. Um, and, and a long background of K-12. There are a lot of students who may have disabilities, but it's masked behind their language capacity. So it's quite probable, quite possible, that they might have uh, anxiety issues or ADHD, but until their English is fluent enough, they can be evaluated. There's not, not much can be done, unfortunately. Okay. And we've been to our office, and we have plans, and we've had a lot of resources. I mean, really, can you pick up on something like that just by speaking to, or? I, you know, do you maybe catch something in the conversation? Uh, when I have a student who I think might have a disability, there's a lot of evaluation to do because many times if they're coming from a country that didn't have a strong educational system, we have students in the school who maybe made it to sixth grade in their native country. You know, so, and it also could have a There's a lot of dynamics. Yeah, uh, in my opinion. We, we can usually do it, but it, it's a lot of evaluations. I really need to un understand the student's background. I would say I can speak from the, I used to be a school psychologist. So in the K-12, if they're suspected of having a learning disability for ESL, they would get tested in their native language to determine if they have an actual learning disability. And then they would have the accommodation in front of the college level. Yeah, you could add. Um, can you might get to this later on? Sure. Some students. I don't know how to phrase this, but it seems like they're supposed to give you the appointment form for the test, like a certain a certain lead time, right? Five days. So I have oh, students that bring it in like the day before. Yes. So they know I'm not in on Friday, so they drop it off on Friday for a Monday test. We're we're we've been very I've been very aware of that, right? Because my office doesn't document when we give them the paper, right? They have to come to us, and we, we're strict, especially during finals, trying to figure out where everybody's going to sit. Um, five days notice. Now the whole testing sheet that they're signing says five days notice, and all the rules and rights of testing. So what we need to change is when we give them the form. So you know that it's not us giving it to them a day before. There are those cases, don't get me wrong, where it is the day before, but usually we'll reach out to the professor also and let them know. So some of them come two weeks before, but they're not giving the forms to the professor. So that is something that I'm going to address. Thank you. You're welcome. What we've done, because it's both happened to us before, what we've done is we know a student needs accommodation, especially for the extended time, and they need to say, we tell them to like fill out like from because we have four exams, so they give us the all four exams. I think the uh, testing center can't give you the finals, but they give it to us already one to four, so that we know already. Because sometimes they forget. So yes. They can do that. that well, 
but if you know ahead of time, yeah. we will do that. Yeah. Uh, we don't do finals because that's yeah. a different beast, but we'll set it up for depart. If you have department exams mm -hmm. and you have certain dates, have yeah, dates. English does that. Math is starting to, um, nursing, radiography, 100%. So, and that makes our lives easier also because it's, we haven't gone to an online scheduling system. So please note that. We use very archaic book in order to figure out where everybody is gonna sit. You know, I know that there was discussion a few years ago about getting an online system, but most of the online systems that are available for disability services are ridiculously expensive because they have high uh, protection things built into them. I mean, obviously, if this information leaks out, not so good. So testing, which I also oversee, they have Appointment Plus. We can't use Appointment Plus. So we're trying to make the process as systematic and as easy as possible. Um, it's, a, it's a big one. I'm going to move on. So. This, is, this, this to me is very important as far as documentation con is concerned and I think it helps alleviate um, assumptions. So this may, the bell curve, this is, uh, if you are aware of it, psychology usually, uh, they use this a lot, but the Weschler Adult Intelligence Scale is the most common IQ test out there and it's something that we're looking for for students that have learning disabilities. So are we seeing students from 50, that get 55 to 70 IQs? 100%, right? The ESL question came up before. Uh, what I've realized now that students take the placement exam, they've always taken placement in our office. I try to read the essays as much as possible because I'm curious about it. I'm very big into numbers and tracking and kind of having uh, data. So the question was, we've had a few students that their essays are coming back as ESL and they have to take LOAP. They're not ESL students. They're low functioning students. So now they get a LOAP letter in the mail and it kind of confuses them even further. Like, I only speak English, so, but their essay, Right, their essay is kind of broken English. I'd say most of us, anywhere from an 85 to really like a 115, 68% of the population falls in this category, right? And then you have your geniuses. So keep in mind, this is very telling for me. Uh, students are, and as a school psychologist in the back can tell you, a lot of students come into this and they have no idea, no idea what those tests mean, right? They're given an IEP and they are never given an explanation as to what it means. So this is the breakdown of the many tests that just the IQ test shows. So their verbal ability, their perceptual reasoning, uh, their processing speed, their memory, just in an IQ score. This is all what we say. Then they're test tested educationally. The most common educational test is called the Woodcock Johnson. Um, it's going through reading, writing, spelling, math, how they compute backwards, forwards. I mean, it's, it's lengthy. It's, it's something that if you saw a, re a regular report, you would know that I do a lot of reading daily. I don't look at just the scores because everyone is an individual, right? They're gonna have little things in there about who they are. Uh, the scores tell us a lot, 100%, but it's not foolproof. So looking at that and going through that very quickly, full scale IQ, 120, verbal comprehension, 125, perceptual reasoning, 120. You could see the scores. What do you think the disability is? So yeah. Disability. It's an LD in math and writing. Okay. What else? Do you want me to keep answering? Yeah. Okay. Please. <laughs> um, processing speed, and people are probably like, how am I figuring this out? Processing speed uh, and also written language. 
has to be a 26 point difference between your cognitive IQ and your achievement IQ. So, for me, also, usually students on the spectrum, right? Very, very smart, right? But they're going to process information slower than most of us. They have a clearly defined disability. This is no joke, right? I mean, you, you have a verbal capability of 125. That's, that's higher than most of us. Right? You, can, you could spit it back. You, could, you have vocabulary in your head. You know information. But in order for you to process it, it's going to take you that much longer. So I always tell students level of frustration. Right? We're not talking three, four points. We're talking like 26 points of frustration. Fluency. When you see fluency scores in my realm, it's all when they're timed. So it, they, you have to do this now. Whoop, there goes the scores. It's not, again, not that they're not capable, right? These are quite capable people. Just going to take them a little bit longer to get there. And I think that, that shows something that most of us aren't aware of. When we're looking at these paper, with this paperwork and it's saying, right, you're seeing a student in front of you and they're kind of like, Are they getting it? Do they understand it? What, what the, what's the blank stare for? Right? And then they're scoring maybe really high on your exams. Again, it's a level of capability. What, what's, the, what's the reality of that student? You're not going to know all this information. Sometimes if <coughs> professors did know, maybe it would really help them. But that's the things that we're looking for. Do we see students on the other end of the gamut? 100%, where they don't really technically have learning disabilities. They're more in the developmental uh, delayed category. Uh, they don't call it mental retardation any longer, but they're on the lower end of the spectrum. So accommodations are not meant to provide an advantage. They are meant to level the playing field. This is a big one for me. College cannot pick and choose which accommodations we should follow. There will always be a reason why they qualify for certain accommodations. Um, you don't just walk into my office and say, I need this. You have to qualify for it. We're going to have a conversation about it, right? We're going we're to do the back and forth, but it's not always a guarantee. So, yes, yes. Is there any financial assistance to a student that has not been, doesn't have the documentation from high school where we've been free when they get over here? Unfortunately, no. It's a very hard thing. I mean, we have certain people that are on our list that will do it at a reduced rate, sometimes if they have health insurance. Uh, but you're talking on average a, a good psych Ed eval is going to cost the student anywhere from $800 to $3,000 privately. Um, sometimes we find people that'll do it for six. Right? That's what we hope for. Some insurance, so, some insurances will cover maybe a psychological evaluation depending on the situation, but they may not going to, you know, and then there's a hot debate, not to get into this, but on diagnosing ADD, ADHD, right? And I would, it's true, most four year institutions will not take a letter from a doctor that says, my child has ADD, ADHD. They are looking for a psychoed eval or they are looking for a neuropsych eval. So think about, I mean, four year school doesn't matter how much the four year school costs, but students are told upfront this is the documentation that's required. We do accept a letter. We ask for a detailed letter. It can't be on a prescription pad. It's not valid. How, per how um, old can the evaluation be? Ah, very good question. For mental health, it really should be updated every year. A student should be in treatment, and this is something um, I'm hoping by the end of the summer I'll have a tracking system for our numbers. Um, and that is something that we'll start to track. 
So mental health should be within a year. They should be in some kind of treatment. Um, <clears throat> a psych and an eval should be within three years, but it really depends on, and it does matter, of what age they were tested. So we always ask for the adult scale. Um, we, we have students that the last time that they were tested was when they were 12. It's a, to me, think about it, right? We've gone through a lot of education between 12 and 18. So yeah, so the scores aren't gonna change that much. It should, they should still be tested as an adult. There's, there's always a way to work out of, you know. What about a high school eval? And if it's within three years, they're coming right out of high school. The high school, depending that. on the high school, right? Yeah. Depending on where the high school is located. I don't care if that gets me in trouble, but it's very true. Um, depending on who the parents are of the child, right? If the school says, we, yeah, you don't need the testing, it really depends. So it should be three years. It really should be three years. Most students 16 and above are tested as adults if they're 15 and younger. So sometimes it's hard with like a freshman who's like 15. I mean, we'll take that, but it's sometimes hard when they transition out. And you can have a 27-year-old in the office, and the last time that they were tested was when they were 18, but they were tested as an adult, so it would still be valid. So the, sometimes the three years is a little tricky. Do you have a list here of the uh, places they can go for evals? I work with low-income students. Yes. So I think there's some places that will consider that, right? In New Jersey, it's very hard to find. I still have a list from New York, and I tell students call because they'll take Medicaid, the Medicare, one of those, the low income one. Sorry, I always forget. Um, they'll do it on a sliding scale. A lot of the big hospitals in New York will do it on a sliding scale. New Jersey, I've called Morristown. Morristown has it, but sometimes you have to be a certain age. Not that I know of. Now that I know of. And Rutgers and Fairley Dickinson actually have a program where they'll do it for cheaper. Um, they still do that. They use PhD fellows that are going into testing to do the testing. So it's still valid. Uh, they're still giving a, a detailed report, but they do it cheaper as well. But we do have a list of people. It, it's kind of keeping up on that. Sometimes people from the high schools, they reach out and they'll say, oh, if there's a need, we'll do it for cheaper, because it's a, it's a big market. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Again, you may be getting to it, but how does FERPA um, play uh, its role in disability services? Great question. So I see a lot of parents that say that they have guardianship over their child. Just because you have guardianship over your child, that does not trump FERPA. Because guardianship is ultimately saying that a student is cognitively impaired and cannot make a decision for themselves. We're talking college here, right? So if they're in college, they are gonna have to make decisions. It's, doesn't, it's not like one of those things where um, you get to pick and choose. Like, oh, I get to speak to financial aid or I'm gonna be able to speak to the bursar's office, I'm gonna be able to speak to the professors, no. So FERPA actually trumps that. Um, ADA and FERPA, I wanna say, work together. I mean, it's just like HIPAA in the medical world. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's, we have to be compliant with a bunch of different things. Really, we fall more under the umbrella of ADA because it all is, all disability documentation. Um, but we, again, can't share that information. We have to keep it sh secure and locked up. Um, every time, even usually when I send emails to professors, I don't include the student's name. And that's not because you know, I'm trying to be sneaky, but because it's limiting, right? It's kind of you, you don't want to put that information out there. But same thing in that, like FERPA, if a parent calls me and says, how's Johnny doing in class? I don't have to answer that question, just like you don't. 
So same guidelines, 18 or whatever it is, even if they're 15, what I try to explain to parents is really FERPA trumps that on a college campus. They're considered adults. So my arch nemesis recording, right? This keeps coming up. Again, this is one of those things you got a copy of the policy that we have students sign. They're also signing at intake that if they decide, if it's an accommodation that they are given, um, I don't think it's the best accommodation, to be honest. Why? Because I think about most traditional students, are they really going to go back and listen to an hour and 15 minute lecture over again? So what I try to encourage is really good technology. There are better note-taking systems out there now, uh, smart pens. That helps guide students. The truth of the matter is, is we're not all great note takers, right? So if you are in a science class, a history class, a psychology class, maybe not English, maybe not math, because you could write what's on the board with a math problem. But if you're giving out systematic notes and a student can't keep up with that, hence the reason for recording. We're going to try in the fall to do a note-taking system here. Uh, you're going to see that on more letters, notes from professor or a volunteer. That takes a lot of work, a lot of work, right? So if the professor's giving out PowerPoint presentations, if they're posting things to Blackboard, that helps us, right? It's kind of like a guideline. I can't tell you I love you if you are doing these things because it really does help students. Um, if we have to get a volunteer for every single class on this campus, think about my life. I mean, there are, certain, there are certain regulations and certain rules that we have to abide by. This is something, can't tell you how many lawsuits are out there. OCR, Office of Civil Rights, will be on this campus if you turn around and say, not in my class. And there are certain departments, I get it, right? The, the department is making, it's not necessary. It's not necessary. What I tell students, if the professor is objecting to it, ask them for another means of notes. Most professors will give something. But understand it in that way. They're looking for the information. Doesn't mean they're lazy. Doesn't mean that they should be able to do like everybody else. They're not going to be able to do like everybody else. That's why they're given this. And it's, again, not a loose accommodation. You may think it's loose because we have a 1,000 students registered with the office and think about the numbers involved in that. So they're being accommodated big OCR thing. It's taking away something from a student that they need to learn puts us at risk. So I always tell students, can't put it on Facebook, can't put it on YouTube, you will get sued. Professor will have a right to sue you. And the professor has the academic license, license over that class. So they can talk about anything they want to talk about. Blatant discrimination? Eh. I think we're all aware of those things, right? But if they want to talk about religion and politics and sex, they're allowed to, right? This is college. I, I understand the hesitation. Nursing, radiography, right? Those types of programs, they're talking about case studies. Again, you, all of us should not be using names. I'm not going to say disability student and Smith. So that's where we kind of have to keep it anonymous. So common practices, I talked about this. Please do not ask for any type of documentation. Ask how I can assist you with your accommodations rather than what is your disability and how does it affect you. A lot of professors, a lot of students will give out that information. Remember that certain behavior may or may not be related to the disability. But note that you should always follow appropriate protocol when dealing with unacceptable behavior. So I can't tell you how many phone calls I get from faculty saying, this kid is driving me crazy, right? They're, 
standing up in the middle of the room. They are running around. I've asked them five times. They asked me 25 questions in 10 minutes. They won't let me move on. If it's something that you would not allow for any other student in the class, then you don't allow it for that student. That is your right, right? Just because they have a disability letter doesn't mean it's a free pass to whatever they want to do. It's the behavior. I can't control behavior. We can give them a little bit of explanation, right? These are the limitations. Set it up up front, right? If you know, like, you lecture, you're going to give a lot of notes, you can limit everyone in the class at the beginning of the semester. I, I have to say, there's certain material I have to get through, so I'm only going to allow maybe one or two questions from each student during my class. But if you have a question, certainly see me on my office hours. Ta-da! Right? It, that's it. If you have that student 15 questions, da 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 Now, like I said to you before, I, I only have time for this amount. Of, that's not being rude. That's not going, it's not violating any law. That's your classroom. So when it comes to the behavior, I, I have conversations all the time with students, right? Like, mm, maybe that wasn't the most appropriate thing. Right? We have students that touch themselves, students that get up, students that do, I've seen it all. I've had students bang their heads against walls. I mean, that's, it's the reality of it. I, I can't, I'm here to support you, right? If you're unsure about anything, please, please, please call me. Do you have a disability statement on your syllabus and what is the message it conveys? Uh, some, some of them, you must do this, you must do that. They don't have to do anything. You can't must anything, right? They can decide to give you that letter beginning of the semester, middle of the semester, end of the semester. They don't have to must do anything. Oh, it drives me insane. If you're unsure about what it says on your syllabus, let me know. And if specific requests, please reach out, I'm here. Those are all the forms that it, they sign a lot of forms in the beginning. I like that they sign a lot of forms, right? Especially for the parents. They get copies. They're not, they, we pull apart, they get copies of what they've signed. We went through this, right? You, you met these agreements. Especially for testing, we don't allow pocketbooks, book bags, anything in the room. We tell them, take your jackets off, hats. Hats sometimes I'm lenient with because for certain students, it's like a huge comfort thing. We check the hats, right? We don't put students with the same test in the same room. Very hard to do, by the way, some classes. Uh, you know, I take it very seriously. That's why they're signing agreements. I say, if you come in here to cheat, you're ruining it for everyone. If professors start to think that my office is allowing the cheating, think about what it means for my office. So please know, we are not helping the students. I don't know calculus, right? I, I'm telling you that up front. I, I do not help <laughs> students on exams. It, that is not my job. Um, sorry to interrupt. Yep. You brought up calculus. I have to teach math. Okay. Um, taking a higher level math course and when it came down to the final exam um, at this point now they were they they wanted and needed a scribe and there was no one available to scribe for them and it was actually came back to me well are you available to scribe how are scribes provided for the students and what kind of background do these scribes have I've had them for some of the lower level classes where they come in and they take notes how are the scribes provided? It's difficult. I won't say that it's not, and especially for high-level math, um, because no one in our office has high-level math. So usually we'll reach out to the department and see if an, an adjunct will do it or if a professor will do it. You're, you're literally scribing. You're, the student has to verbally tell you what to write down. And with math, that's difficult. I don't know all those symbols. Um, it depends on the student. For a regular, a regular class, uh, for most of us can scribe it, but the technology is certainly not good for math. Even with science, sometimes it's limited. So that's why we'll reach out. 
I mean, we have a student that's taking a computer course over the summer, physically will not be able to manipulate a computer. So we have to hire someone and that's hard to find. And it's hard to find, think about it, this hard, depending on the class, like remedial English or remedial math, everybody in the class is usually on the same level. So there's no good note taker, right? And if we have to go and pay for every student to get a note taker, it would cripple us. So it's, it's really for those students that need a paid note taker that we would reach out to the departments. Do they reach out early in the, I mean, this was, you know, the week before finals. Is there something that's set up, you know, in August put out? Is there anybody interested? I mean, I've never received anything prior to this, and I've been here a few years, and all of a sudden, like I said, the student decided to use this accommodation at the tail end of the course instead of from the beginning. Um, but they said they had nobody to accommodate the needs. The, the thing is, is the notice that we receive, and we do, then we do the scrambling, right? So you're right, the student just decided that now he wanted to scribe for the final. So that put us in hot water, so it's us scrambling, yes. It's kind of hard to put out a catch-all in the beginning of a semester because we don't know what the, the demand is. The only time that sometimes there's a loophole is when a student is deaf and hard of hearing, they have to give notice at letting us know when they need an interpreter. Uh, so if you can't give us 24 hour notice, but you better make sure that, I, that they have accommodations for the classroom for the semester. So there are certain things that yes, I mean it make, makes us look bad, but sometimes we don't know, right? And if for other students that have physical needs and they need a scribe, um, we try and set that up. But it's getting, a student that's willing to sit in a class too. I mean, it's kind of hard for the money that they're given to sit in a class that they're not taking to take an extra set of notes. We're, we're hoping for the fall that it's going to be a little bit better. Thank you. You're welcome. So think about a student in the wheelchair. Is your understanding of their disability different because you can't see their disability. You know, I always refer to this and people are like, oh, that's a little cruel, but it's the truth, right? You're gonna hold a door, right? You're gonna help. You, you see the dog, you see the cane, it's there. It's right there, you can't deny it. All your students are not gonna have those things. Please keep that in mind. You don't know what they're dealing with. Sometimes it's frustrating that I know and you don't. We can have an educated conversation about that. And that is it. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>